How is it that you came to be involved in mining in Utah? That's a long, circuitous trip. <laughs> <laughs> I, I graduated as an engineer uh, and went to work for Boeing in Seattle. I graduated at the University of Illinois as a civil engineer and got involved in the Minuteman missile program. And I was involved with changes to uh, the sites and many of those changes involved the underground launcher, launch control buildings, as well as the launch control centers. Um, I, after uh, two and a half years in Seattle, had an opportunity to go to a field job in, in, uh, at Hill Air Force Base. Um, and we were installing training facilities there for the Air Force. And I decided that the half-life of an engineer in the aerospace industry was probably about three years, and I was coming up onto that anniversary, so I started looking at other opportunities. And, they, and I saw an advertisement for a mining engineer in Green River, Wyoming. And I had done a number of interviews at different places, but they said civil engineers were acceptable. So I ended up going and interviewing there, and then the, at the end of that, uh, of my stint in, in, uh, at Hill Air Force Base, I was living in Ogden, I uh, took a job with Stauffer Chemical Company in Green River, Wyoming as a uh, mining engineer, and it was a Trona mine. Trona is a sesquicarbonate. Uh, uh, they make soda ash. And soda ash out of, the, out of the mineral was used in glass manufacturing. So I kind of grew up in my career at Stauffer in, out of Green River, Wyoming. How did you end up in Utah? Well, <laughs> I ended up in Utah because uh, I always had to, had the opportunity to take people on tours of our mining operation. I used to tell people, if you want to go underground, and don't be too, too concerned about it because our mine was like going into the basement of Macy's department store. It was all lit up and we had concrete floors down around the shop. We had a warehouse underground. We had offices there. Uh, and we used uh, Cushman scooters to get around like you do on the golf course. So they're very quiet and, and, and uh, our roadways were very dust free and all lighted all the way out to where we were doing, uh, to the mining sections. So it was a very comfortable place to be. Uh, I was asked to, to take a tour for some fo folks with Coastal Corporation. And the people that came to take the tour was the, I think was one of their mine superintendent, the vice president and general manager of the Southern Utah, uh, the Southern Utah Fuel Company operation out of Salina, and their uh, senior vice president out of Houston. And so I showed them all the things that we were doing. And I had the opportunity while I was with Stauffer to visit lots of mines. I told them, I said, I'm not a mining engineer, I don't have a mining background, I need to learn. And so they said, just go do it. So I did. I, I traveled to Canada and, and all over the, the U.S. I, in coal mines as well as other mines to learn how other people did it. So I spent my time on that tour showing them why their coal mining operation was really substandard <laughs> and showed them all the neat things we were doing. It wasn't a couple of weeks later I got a couple of calls and they wanted me to come to work for them. I said, well, I don't want to ever work in a lousy coal mine. <laughs> I had all kinds of reasons that I didn't like coal, the, the coal mining industry at that time. But uh, uh, I did go on an interview with them and, and they, were, they were insistent. And six months later I accepted the job. So I went to went to Salina, Utah, and became the, uh, the mine superintendent at, uh, at a underground coal mine that was growing. It was a, quite an exciting time because they were, they were uh, doing things that the other 
coal mines in Utah weren't doing at the time. Do you remember what year this was? 1977. And do you remember the name of the mine? The mine at... At, at Salina. It was Southern Utah Fuel Company as the Convulsion Canyon Mine. Okay. Still there. Still most productive and the largest mine in the state of Utah today. When you were in that position at Sufco, was that a union mine? No, it, it was union free, still is. It's a different company now, but Arch, Arch Minerals, I believe, own, owns uh, the mine now. What was your, what was your job as, as the superintendent? Well, I actually took a demotion because I was superintendent. I was directly over the mining operations only. Maintenance I did not have, and I did not have engineering at that time. Uh, but uh, with, with the way the, the operation was growing, I, was very, I thought that was a neat challenge. And, and so I was over direct, just directly over the mining operation itself, as well as the outside tipple operations, which is the coal loading and transporting operations. So I had that under, under, under me too. But I wasn't there very long. In, in 19, in two years, in 79, they promoted me uh, to the vice president and general manager of the operation. What would a typical work day be like for you at, at that time? Typically, I would be at the mine for at least 10 hours. Uh, probably my, my normal day it was uh, 30 minutes or so to the mine. So my normal day would be uh, 11 or 12 hour day. Uh, 10 on, on a short day would be a 10 hour day. And, uh, and I spent time at the mine. I spent many, many shifts at the mine uh, uh, overnight. Uh, uh, the best part of of my job was was getting down in the mine and talking to the to the miners, making sure we had the support we needed. Uh, you know, as I told told them and and all of my supervisors, the best thing I can do for you is is get you the tools you need and help you get your job done. And uh, and we had. We had we accomplished some neat things. We grew the mine very rapidly. Uh, uh, first million tons uh, a year came out under my uh, while I was there, and we and it, of course it's ramped up now. That mine's uh, in the six to seven million ton range a year. I went to Skyline uh, in 1981. In 1981, as vice president, general manager of Skyline Mine, I had the opportunity to to build a mine from from the Portal Inn. So it was it was a un, unique and very very neat experience. In the past interviews that we've done, we've talked to people who walk into an existing operating mine, mm -hmm. but the Skyline Mine you were starting up. Yeah, yeah, that was a big How do you advantage. go about starting up a coal mine? <laughs> you don't hire coal miners. <laughs> and, 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 and there's some truth to that. We did hire coal miners, but we didn't hire, we hired people. And we hired people with attitudes and values. We had a luxury of hiring 3% of our applicants. And so 97% didn't make it. We developed a very, uh, very detailed, in-depth interview process where we interviewed our folks and we weren't after, you know, you can get education and, and uh, experience uh, off a resume. 
and a lot of people use that to, as their main sorting technique. But you, do, you have a real tough time getting to personal values, personal beliefs, ideas about what uh, their job's going to mean to them, what kind of career opportunities they want in the future, uh, what kind of dedication they, they, they have as a person to, to their occupation. And uh, so we it didn't make any difference to the janitor we were, at, we were hiring or whoever. We wanted to know what made them tick and what were their values. We, you know, people that, have, that, are, that are proud of who they are and, and what their efforts in life produce are the people we wanted to hire. Tell me a little bit about the, the planning that goes into opening a, a new coal mine. Well, I can't remember the numbers, but it was, you know, a few million bucks worth of permitting and planning that went into opening the coal mine. Uh, the permits were voluminous, you know, the environmental permits and how the mine site was set up, what you did with the streams that are coming through the sites, the removal of the, of the topsoil, the storage of it, the, uh, the uh, plans to, that even included the restoration of the site after you were done mining. And the underground design was quite, was, uh, had to be done. So we had to do a lot of ex exploratory type drilling, core drilling to find out the thicknesses and the qualities of the coal and make sure that we had a mine laid out that, that we could get into the coal seams and get, get to where the, uh, the coal was and, and get uh, a good extraction of that resource. Um, the mine design is, is, is complex because there, were, there are faults, there are dikes, dikes are ig igneous intrusions that go through the coal. Uh, it, it was, the uh, coal mine was dipping so you knew the water was always going to run downhill. You had to handle water coming into the mine and the coal's cleated so that you have to mine it in a direction so that you don't get big slabbing taking place that where the coal comes off of the, the ribs or the walls and d becomes dangerous. So th there's a lot of things that had to take place in, in, in the mine design as well as on the surface design and in the permitting. Um, so it took a team of engineers. We had an engineering staff going in that did, did those preliminary designs and they all became part of the permitting process and that was a it took two years to do that before we ever started and in Skyline we had a partner to start with it was Getty Getty Oil was our partner uh, they had a 50 percent ownership in the partnership and they had a team of engineers also that were that uh, that were looking at what we were doing and and we had to have approval from both partners in order to proceed. So that, and then uh, Coastal bought out Getty's interest, and we became it was, the operation became a little easier to handle without having two two owners. But uh, after after they bought Getty out, so. it took a couple, two years to do the surface construction. And during the second year is when we started mining, and we had we had. Uh, uh, the surface office building had been constructed and, uh, and we had uh, uh, places to, to uh, shower and do all that with the miners so we started our mining operation um, and that was a, a, a kind of an interesting time and if you remember in 1983, that winter, we had the 100-year event. We had the big snows and the runoffs, and thistle slid. 
and the railroad going to the west was no longer operational. The DNRG that went out to the west, and that was where the coal that we were mining, we were, that was where our market was. So we stockpiled coal at Soldier Summit during that period of time. But we had a roughly uh, uh, well, let's just call it a third, a third, and a third, but I'm, these aren't the exact numbers, but we, a third of our workforce force came from, from uh, Spanish Fork area in Utah Valley. We are busing them to the mine. A third of our workforce came from San Pete County and Northern Sevier County. Uh, and we bust them from Fairview to the mine, and the other, other, the rest of them came from Carbon County. And actually, at the when we started, Carbon County had the least percentage. We had more more employees from Utah County and 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 San Pete County. Uh, well, thistle slid, so we couldn't get people from from Spanish Fork to the mine anymore by going. So we bust them into. Fairview and then up, up the canyon. And then Fairview Canyon slid <laughs> and on Memorial Day. And so, that, so we lost that access to the mine. That was the majority of our workforce. And I lived in San Pete County. But we didn't stop operating. We kept operating. We, we bust everybody to the mine through Salina and up up uh, Soldier Summit back from Fairview. That was a four-hour trip. From Spanish Fork, we bust them over the top into uh, Duchesne or whatever the, however you come over the top back into into uh, uh, by Helper and up the top. That was a four-hour bus trip, one way. So we went to a four-day work week. And four days happened in three days because our work days, we changed the work days to 18 hour days. So we'd work eight, take 10 off to eat and sleep and go back to work. And we divided the workforce into two, two pieces. So there was a Monday through Wednesday piece and a Thursday through Saturday piece. And, and we converted the top floors of our office building that was designed for 900 people to, into bunkhouses and we used the the uh, National Guard, uh, we had borrowed the cots from the National Guard and they brought their coolers full of food to last them for the three days they were going to be there. We plugged in a bunch of, of TVs with a VCR type tape so they could watch their movie and go to sleep and get up. They didn't have time to really get in trouble and go downtown because <laughs> they had 18 hour days. And we didn't lose, and that, and and in August when they when the uh, highway reopened uh, up uh, through Thistle, and we got uh, Fairview Canyon reopened, we hadn't lost a single employee. We we all made it through it, and and, uh, and it was quite quite a unique experience. But that was under the development time of the mine when the mine was first starting up, and we were just trying to get our entries in to where we could actually get into high production mining. And that coal that we stockpiled at Soldier Summit all at once became a valuable commodity because that was at the same time that the Wilbur mine disaster happened. And that coal then went to Utah Power and Light to keep them going. So uh, it wasn't planned that way, but it ended up that way. and and. We, we survived uh, that, that time frame and, and then we got a contract with Intermountain Power. We, were the, we, had, the first, we had the first contract with uh, Intermountain Power to deliver coal to them and, uh, and we were up and running. Anyway, we, that's, that's where we got started and, uh, and we became, then we were, uh, from day one, we planned on being a long wall mine and uh, so that's where our prime goal was, is to develop into the coal seams so we could uh, panel off uh, areas for long wall mining. And so we got that going and that, that brought the production up. And when I left uh, 
the mine in 1993, we were up to 5 million tons a year. And we were the largest coal mine in the western United States when I left. And, and when you say long wall mining, what, what length of the face are you talking? Well, they, it varies. And uh, faces at the time that we started, I think we were at 550 foot long face. But uh, that expanded over the years. Some long walls in some of the mines now are 1,000 feet or better long uh, face. Um, but we, were, we started at 550, and I think we expanded it, I think, uh, you know, to 600 to 650 or so. Was it exclusively long wall? Did you have some continuous miners? Well, the, yes, we always had continuous miners, and you have to have some way to develop your entries to block off your your long wall. So, you know, uh, it, that was all. There's always a, a, a kind of a mix and match that you got to have enough continuous miner operations to continue to get your development out ahead of your long wall production, so that you don't run out of out of places to put your long wall. So. Uh, yeah, it depends on how productive your continuous miners are, how many units you need to do that. But I guess normally speaking, you'd have a, a couple continuous miners developing for every long wall. Was subsidence an issue? Subsidence was an issue. Whether it should have been or not is a good question. <laughs> uh, subsidence, we had subsidence. You're going to take out all, the, all, your, all your coal, you're going to lower the, lower the ground. And so I remember we've had s several visits about, you know, uh, where we're going to subside and how we're going to subside and whether it's what, is, what we're going to mess up by subsiding. So I, I always had a neat tour that I took all of the folks that wanted to come and see all the problems we had to subsidence. I'd take them up on the mountain. and. In a, in a van or something up on one of the back roads and we'd get out and I'd, we'd walk across the place and, and over here so we had a good view and I says, okay. Now who saw where we subsided? Nobody saw anything, of course. I said, well, you just walked across a place that was at uh, six feet lower now than it was a year ago. And uh, you're now standing on a place that hasn't subsided at all. <laughs> And so that was the first education about what it looks like on the surface. Now I says, now come over here and I'll show you things you've got to look for. And I said, now this is where the long wall is and it's moving this way. And it takes a little time before, the, before you see the ground move. But if you look over there, those quakies are tilted. And you look down a little ways, those quakies are straight up. Well, they were tilted to start with. Because when they subside, you lay the ground down and they tilt. And when you keep doing it, the ground goes back up and they stand back up. Now you can tell where the, where the exact uh, that curve is happening on the surface. We did have subsidence. You could see it. You could measure it. It really didn't become a, it didn't become a mining issue after we, uh, we had good experience with it. Was the company part of the community where the miners lived? Did they get involved in community activities? Very much so, and they we they encouraged us to do that. And you know, personally, I was when I was in Slain, I was on the hospital board. Uh, I was uh, involved with the Boy Scout program, and uh, same thing when I moved up to San Pete and. Got involved with the community and was president of the Lions Club up there, and so yes, uh, we were encouraged to do that. A lot of a lot of our employees were involved locally. We we uh, we we didn't we didn't uh, contribute to the communities directly through with money type grants or that sort of thing. Con but we certainly participated with the community. The local, the local uh, girls camp up there, we took equipment up there, front end loaders and stuff, and helped them do some construction work and, 
we uh, in the local community we would we would uh, be involved at, all the way to, with our celebrations and I'd go buy a, one of the top lambs at Lamb Day in Fountain Green. <laughs> we'd, we'd do, so we, we got involved and we were part of the community. Uh, 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 our people were, I should say, more, more than the company, the people were. Is there anything else about uh, your time at the Skyline Mine that you want to share with us? Um, I would say that uh, if I were to share just with, 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 for the archives and for the public is, you know, the profession uh, of, of the folks that are involved in mining, and not so much, no, no matter whether it's coal mining or other mining, you know, you, you work closely with, with close-knit groups. I mean, when you're down there on a crew and you're mining for eight hours a day every day of the, you 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 you, you form a, a very tight knit team if you're if you if your job is going well, and uh, and the people can become proud of what they do and and every day's a, a challenge. You think it, it 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 doesn't get to be as routine as as some jobs were like a manufacturing job because. When you're underground and, and developing a uh, a mine, you're you, you're uncovering new ground, and there's new things you find all the time. We got had dinosaur tracks in the roof. We crossed faults, and we'd hit wa uh, places where water would come in, and and so you're always always dealing with new new types of issues, and still trying to maintain the goals you're setting. And, and so what I'm trying to say is when you, I share that with people that have never been in a mine and don't know anything about mining is there is a, a camaraderie that takes place in the mines. Uh, there's, a pro, uh, there's some real pro, pride that goes along with what you do and what you accomplish, especially when you can do it in, in a, a safe manner because we got a you know, mine's got a bad reputation about being an unsafe place to work, and they, and there, and there's no doubt about it. There's, it's a high risk place to work, but the risk can be mitigated, and the risk can be uh, managed so that you don't put individuals at risk. You, you know, you learn what they are, and you pretty well can can make sure those risks don't Im impact individuals. So. Uh, I'd say it's a good place to work, and it, it was a fun career. As far as Skyline goes, it's a good operation. We had a, I had a good time there. Uh, proud of what what we did. Thinking about your time at the Skyline Mine, what stands out in your memory as your proudest achievement? I think the proudest achievement I have personally at Skyline is the people. Uh, we had, you know, you, you hire, when you, when you put together a workforce, we, we peaked at 300 people at 5 million ton instead of 900 like that was projected. And so we were very productive. But we had, we had an excellent workforce. We had you always hire, have some folks that don't that may not fit or uh, that isn't their career and they're not happy with where they're at and all that sort of thing. But overall, that was a that was a wonderful bunch of people. And my proudest thing is is, ha is having a uh, a group there that were that were proud of what they did when they went home. They could talk to their neighbors, they could bring their families, we'd take them underground and show them what the work was like, and they, were, they would brag about it. And I think that, and I was asked once by, uh, by our corporate 
president, uh, uh, the coal mining president, uh, to tell me, to tell him what made us so so productive and and successful, and uh, and he expected all the technology things. You know, everybody, anybody can buy a long wall, anybody can buy a continuous miner. You know, there's several companies to make them. You might, might one might be a little better than another, but uh, it's the people that made it make it go. So that's my proudest thing. We had a, we were able to put together a, a, a neat, neat workforce that, that they they worked together and they played together. And they enjoyed each other. How would you summarize your career in the Utah coal mines? Well, I came I came to Utah in 1977 uh, as as a superintendent in, at Southern Utah Fuel. And I left in 1993 to go east as, the, as a senior vice president for the company for our eastern operations. So during that time, from 77 to 93, uh, I, had, uh, I had three different positions. I was superintendent at, at Sufco and Vice President General Manager, and then I went to Skyline as Vice President General Manager. had had the uh, the job to to get that mine running and 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 get it up to full production. And I have to say it it was a it, it was a fun time in my in my career. It was an exciting time, and it was a proud time because we did did the things that we planned on doing. It was something I never in my, in my wildest dreams thought I'd ever, ever be involved in the mining industry to start with. And when I got involved, I didn't think I'd ever be in the coal mining industry. When I got in the coal mining industry, I didn't think I'd ever be building a, <laughs> one of the biggest and, and most productive and safest mines in, in the world. But it ended up that way and, uh, and I have no regrets. I think I think it was a good part of my my life.